Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, we should have a very good session today. We've just still got several people still connecting in. Um, so uh, while they're doing so, we'll do a quick introduction and, and, and then get started. So we're here today to uh, talk about commercial building owners and specifically how to monetize small cells, and of course, a discussion about 5G. Um, no discussion in wireless these days is complete without a discussion for 5G. Um, my name is Ian Gillett from IGR. And um, before I introduce uh, our guest speaker today, I just want to go through a few logistics um, to um, uh, just to let you know what's happening today. So firstly, we are recording this session. Um, and the recording will be available in about 24 hours. You'll receive an email from us with details of how to download and access the recording. Um, the, uh, uh, we'll also send you out the slides as well from today's presentation, so no need to try and write everything down. Um, we will be taking questions today. Um, if you look on the GoToWebinar control panel, there is a questions tab, and um, just use that, type in the questions as we go. We'll either address them um, as we go through the presentation, or we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so with that, I want to um, uh, introduce uh, our guest speaker today, uh, Shervin Garami, who is CEO of uh, Small Cell Site. Uh, welcome, Shervin. Good morning, Ian, thank, and thank you, Ian. Thank you. So um, what we're going to do today um, is uh, just kind of review the agenda here, um, do a quick introduction. I'm actually going to start out by kind of setting the landscape here in terms of small cells. So, and I'm going to look at it a little bit more from the industry point of view, from the mobile operators. What are the benefits for small cells? Why do they want them? Um, how big is the opportunity? What are they actually move, uh, uh, trying to accomplish? Um, how many small cells are we going to need out there in the US? Then I'm going to hand over to Shervin, who's going to talk about it more from the um, building owner perspective looking towards the operators as an opportunity. So what are the trends that he sees? What is the small cell problem? Um, small cells are not easy to deploy. And um, then we'll get into the indoor and outdoor opportunities. Um, Sherman's going to talk about some of the issues with the property owners and then small cell sites, <laughs> I said it's fast five times, small cell sites solutions to those problems and how the how small cell site can help the uh, the building owners. Um, so um, with that, uh, we've already got one question already. I, I think that's a record, actually. <laughs> Four minutes into a webinar, we have a question already. Um, um, so uh, um, <laughs> I've just got the last now this morning. Um, okay, so with that, let's uh, let's get into uh, the benefits here. So one of the things, of course, for mobile operators today is competition. Um, uh, we have an extremely competitive U.S. market between the big four um, mobile operators. Um, they spend a lot of money uh, making sure that we, their consumers, are happy. And, of course, they try and minimize churn, the switching between carriers. It's very expensive for them. Um, and one of the main things, of course, the, one of the main reasons that people churn is they say, I have no coverage, I have no, no bars. Um, so the, uh, the idea of deploying small cells is, as we all know, there are many places that have um, dead zones um, or there's no coverage, um, especially in downtown areas. So in a downtown area between two buildings, uh, maybe going into an under, underground garage, um, maybe uh, there's uh, trees around or whatever it is. Um, we all know those places where, you know, if you walk around this corner, I'm going to drop that call. So deploying a small cell can alleviate that problem and provide coverage at that location. Um, and obviously, you know, it leads to more uh, happier consumers. Um, one of the interesting things of, this, of putting in small cells is when you actually improve the coverage, um, then you improve, actually can potentially improve the battery life for that phone as well. When your phone actually loses connection, you hit that dead spot, the phone actually goes out and hunts for a signal. 
it turns up the power on the radio and starts hunting for a signal. Um, and that uses more battery life. Uh, the big consumers of battery on your phone are actually the screen and the radio used to connect to the network. Um, so having better coverage actually leads to um, an improved battery life. You may have seen the effect of this if you're driving between two cities and you start lo losing a signal, you may get to the other end and your phone is down to 30% or something because along the way it's been hunting in and out of cell sites trying to find a signal. Um, higher throughput and faster data connections for subscribers. Um, uh, obviously, you know, much of what people do today is data-based rather than voice-based. Uh, millennials, of course, need data all the time, everywhere. Um, they can't survive without Snapchat and Instagram. Um, and we also need that, those higher throughputs and faster data connections for 5G. The five, coming 5G networks actually are based on today's LTE networks. So having a good LTE network today means that you've got a very good basis for 5G going forward. Improved quality of experience for the subscribers, including on, those on a macro cell. Now this is a little strange. You say, well, why would, if I put in small cells, why does it make the experience better for everybody? So if you imagine a uh, large cell covering, let's say, part of a downtown area, and there's some holes, coverage holes, as we said, then um, if we fill in those holes, those subscribers are now not um, trying to get onto that macro cell. As a cell site loads up, as more people get onto it, um, one of the things that happen is the coverage actually shrinks a little. The, the edges of the cell come in, and so the cell actually gets smaller. So if I can offload some of those people from the, the big cell onto a small cell, I make the service overall for everybody else remaining on the big cell um, better. Everybody gains. Um, ability to support new and emerging technologies um, with things like inaccurate, sorry, accurate in building location, M2M, IoT, etc. So small cells obviously providing this, this coverage, also providing capacity in areas that were previously hard to reach. I can now offer some new technologies as well. So security um, coverage around a building, for example, for connecting uh, cameras wirelessly. Um, the, uh, the next one's a little techie. With respect to remote radio head, RRH, centralized baseband is potentially a move towards cloud RAN architecture. And so what this means is the architecture of the new networks is, is shifting from what we've seen previously. The operators are actually putting in what we call cloud RAM, where a lot of the, the basis for the um, radios is actually up in the cloud, and they connect with fiber to a, um, a remote radio head, it's called, which is a small radio sitting on a pole or a tower. Um, this gives them a lot of flexibility. Um, it gives them more reliability. It also changes the cost structure and reduces the cost. That becomes important for us consumers as you start thinking about competition, the fact that we're not paying a lot more for our service these days. Um, and so, the, and again, offering more services in more places becomes important for the operators. And then finally, as I said, um, LTE is the basis for 5G, but we can also use this as the basis for private LTE networks and private 5G networks. So we are, there are people now looking at and about to deploy um, networks, especially in building, in campus, that use um, private, there are private networks. They're only applicable to the people who work in that building or applications that are running in that building. If a, 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 a member of the, the public, a consumer, walks into that building, they would not have access to that network. So think of it as uh, like a Wi-Fi network, but using LTE just for that building. Now on top of that, we can put in, um, uh, we can, on a private network, we can put in other applications and services. So as I mentioned, those security cameras, for example, in a building, we probably want to run on a private network. Um, maybe the maintenance staff, uh, the people working in the building, um, 
tenants in that building having access to a private network to ensure quality of service, things like this. So small cells address a lot of different issues. Um, now, I've mentioned coverage a lot. I didn't mention capacity of the network. Um, the reason for this is a lot of times today, the carriers are still putting in small cells to fill in little holes. But increasingly, we find the fact that on a busy street corner, let's say, people pull out their cell phones and there's no, they can't get on the network because there's no capacity on the network. There's too many people already using it. The service is there, the signal is there, but there's just too many people. So deploying a small cell for capacity reasons is becoming increasingly common, obviously in downtown areas. Um, and this certainly occurs you know, around a busy, busy street corner, inside a building, um, things like sporting events, uh, you know, um, concerts, places where there's lots and lots of people gathering. Um, so this next slide is uh, the last one for me, and I'm going to hand off to Shervin. But um, this is actually a comparison of the uh, for the U.S. of the outdoor small cells, um, and it says TAM with actuals. So the blue line is the total addressable market. The red line is how many we're actually putting in um, as an industry. And you can see I forecast this out to uh, 2022. Um, you'll notice as well, I don't have any, uh, I'm just gonna, there we go, that's what I wanted. You'll notice I don't have any uh, numbers on this chart. <laughs> that was intentional. There's a lot of detail in this chart and I'm happy to talk to anybody afterward, but I'll give you a few numbers here. Um, today, uh, in the US, we have about 150,000 small cells actually deployed. Um, that's about 42,000, sorry, 42% 42 of what we actually need. Um, the way we calculate how many we need is we look at how much capacity we need in the network to meet the demands of the consumers with their Netflix and Instagrams and Snapchats. And then we look at how much capacity the, uh, the major networks actually are delivering. And the blue line is therefore how many cells we'd need to meet that, um, that capacity demand. The red line is how many we've actually got in there. Now, if you notice, as we move forward, um, uh, the good news is, you can see my little notes here, the good news is the red line goes up. Um, and we actually get to you know, three quarters of a million, a million or so small cells um, in uh, early next decade. Um, things actually look pretty good. The problem is the blue line actually increases uh, um, <laughs> faster. Um, by 2022, I think we'll have met just over half of the need for small cells. But people are adding um, or demanding more bandwidth so much faster that we can't, as an industry, are having trouble keeping up with that demand. And so the blue line grows very quickly. I'll give you one very good example of this uh, is Netflix. Netflix used to use standard definition, um, so pretty easy data stream to a mobile device. Some of the newer programming on Netflix uses high definition. iTunes now movies, most of them are HD, that doubles the amount of data required to watch a program or a movie. Um, go to any news site today, and it always has some video clips on it. Um, but all of them do. Um, that adds to data. So the amount of data that people are using is actually doubling every two or three years. And so the, the networks have to keep up with that. Building new towers is difficult. Therefore, we look at small cells, but again, building small cells is, is difficult. So what this chart is telling you is, if, uh, if we have good demand for small cells today, we're gonna have much better demand for small cells tomorrow. And in four years time, five years time, that demand will still be there. Um, we, uh, uh, you know, this is not a problem that's gonna get solved next year or the year after. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to Shervin, who's going to talk about uh, small cell site and start addressing some of these problems and, and how you realize that opportunity to 
um, put in more small cells. Shevin. Thank you, Ian. So just to understand why the small cells and outdoor small cells are being deployed, one of the things that we have to understand is where are those locations going by the operators? And as Ian illustrated, it's where the capacity and the coverage is needed. And what happens is the network, 20% of the network for an operator represents 80% of the problem in terms of congestion. So what operators are looking to do right now, even at this time, even to the future of 2021, is to find the locations where they have the highest congestion and make the deployment of small cells to alleviate the capacity that's happening, the congestion, all the Netflix that's occurring. So how do they deploy it? Right now, as you speak to the operators, they're not able to deploy fast enough. They're at a race to deploy small cells every day. They're trying to find ways to be able to deploy small cells. And usually those locations that they pick are in downtown. It could be inside malls, stadiums, wherever they can deploy additional capacity to be able to meet the demand of the consumption of data. And usually what they do is there's three avenues. They either go on right-of-ways, private buildings or private infrastructure, or smart cities. And then the fourth one is the building, which is becoming part of the utility, which we'll talk about in the upcoming slides. But what we have to realize is when an operator looks for and wants to deploy a small cell, they look at really a couple of variables. One is they want to make sure that the cost and the rent to deploy that small cell meets their business model. Second is speed. And the speed comes in from the zoning, making sure they get the permits to be able to get the small cell placed in for various reasons, and also being able to get the acquisition of that location, getting a lease signed. That speed is something very critical for them. And lastly is the right location. They want to make sure that wherever they do place that small cell, it provides that improvement in service for the customers and also for the building or the, or the private property or even the inside the building that they're placing it in. These points is what truly addresses how small cells get deployed. There's a lot of other variables applied to it, but the main three points is really what's addressed. There's a lot of questions that have come up about where, how does a small cell look like? How big is it? The reality is small cells are small. Compared to what we see in a traditional tower, it's very small. It's almost sometimes the size of a, just a normal Wi-Fi router. It gets placed in, it's pretty ubiquitous, and it provides a need that's happened. At the end, though, where an operator wants to go, it has to address that problem statement, where 20% of the network has 80% of the congestion or where they have a lot of the demand that's occurring that they try to alleviate. Um, the next slide on that. So what is that problem statement? The operators have to deploy a lot of small cells. Right now, as Ian illustrated in the slides prior, there's each operator at minimum has to deploy 100,000 small cells. That is, if you currently look at an operator at this moment for the last 20 years, they roughly have 40,000 to 60,000 towers. What operators want to do now is deploy almost two to three times the number of towers in terms of small cells in the next five years. That means speed. They have to be able to acquire, understand who the property owner is that's willing to allow their property to be used to have a small cell there to provide a better signal. And this applies for 4G and 5G. And MLOs are also looking at ways to reduce their costs. They have to deploy so many of these that the business model has to make sense. And really what happens is they have to go through this process called fat acquisition. Fat acquisition is we have a specific location we want to deploy a small cell. They hire individuals to go hunt and find a willing property owner that's willing to say, yes, I will allow a small cell place in my property. I will accept it for this rent. And it could be for five years, 10 years, 25 years. But the property owner, and this is where the dichotomy occurs, is that as the operators want to deploy these small cells fast, there's a lack of education because things are moving so fast. Property owners don't understand what is a small cell, how does it get placed, what does it really do, is there any issues? They need education. What's the right rate? You know, what, how is the rate determined for rent? Is it based on size? Is it based on length? Is it based on a combination of both? 
Does power get included? Do I need to provide backhaul? These are questions that need to get addressed. And there's a lot of work being done to try to educate property owners, asset owners, people who own stadiums, venues, how to address these points. Lastly, wireless is becoming that fourth utility. There's a lot of articles out there that talk about how wireless is a need inside buildings. When I work with a lot of property owners, one of the big things that they say is they have tenants coming in saying, I don't have service here. I will not go into this building until there's service for this provider. It is becoming a utility. It's driving everyone's business, how they work and how they live. And lastly is the reality, and people don't enjoy hearing this, is that operators have a business model. We all, as, because customers want to pay less for the wireless service, so that means that the operators get less money. So they're trying to find ways to deploy a lot at a low cost. And this is a true problem statement. How do you create a process and a mechanism that allows the carrier to deploy the number of small cells they didn't need to do in the next five years, make sure it's fast, it meets their business model, but also provides the customers what they're looking for. And this, these three things need to get solved. And that's currently the problem that everyone's facing, both from the property owners, because they get inundated with everyone knocking on the doors. We want to deploy small cells, we want to deploy small cells. The property owner asks, what is it? What do I need to do it? I thought there's a tower. There's coverage. I've got five bars. I don't understand why I need it. Even if I want to place it, what do I get out of it? How much, how do I incentivize it? This is the question that we need to resolve. And this is what we're going to talk through. Uh, next slide. So what is the opportunity? So the way we want to discuss about the opportunity, there's two avenues. One is the outdoor, and then one is the indoor. The fact is that 80% of traffic that happens in wireless occurs indoor in terms of data. However, you still need the mobility and being able to move. So outdoor first it gets addressed by placing outdoor small cells. Those are the locations where there is high mobile traffic, high pedestrian traffic, congregation, and there's a need to deploy outdoor small cells. How does it get monetized? Is there's a mechanism for property owners to address and say, I have a vertical structure. It could be a light pole, it could be a billboard, it could be the building, the rooftop, the side of the building. It could be even as simple as street furniture. That that location is viable for placing a small cell to increase the capacity. There is potentially, and what I'm forecasting, and there's numbers out there much higher for my forecast, 500 small cells, 500,000 small cells to be deployed by 2021. If you add 5G along with the millimeter wave technology, which is high bandwidth, but it's hard to penetrate, it could get in the number of millions of small cells by 2025. That number is just astronomical. So there has to be a mechanism that allows property owners to be able to take advantage of this. A property owner can get roughly 150 to 400 dollars a month per small cell per location every month it's a check that happens and comes in but the issue is that opportunity is not realized because it's a hunting process right now for prop for the operators they have to identify the location and literally go knock on doors how can we simplify that knowing that there's millions of these small cells about to be deployed in the next 10 years how do we solve that problem there has to be a partnership we have to provide a mechanism so that operators and the property owners are able to identify the match with a minimal effort. If this is going to happen in the speed that's required, this has got to be the way it has to be solved. And the money comes in. Operators are incentivized to want to find these property owners fast because that triangle that we illustrated is the key point. They want to do it fast. They want to make sure it's minimal effort to deploy, and they want to be able to find a low price point. The lower the price point, the more they will deploy. And then at the end, the better the service will be and the more wireless data will be available for the customers. And next slide. So what is indoor then? Again, indoor is no more different than the outdoor is as what it is with any other utility. Wireless is a critical need 
in every building. What's happening, and this is a trend that's occurring, as as you tenants walk inside the building, they pull their phone and make sure their operator has service. It has become the fourth utility. Choice is an issue. What's happened now is there's so much options in technology for a property owner to decide for their in-building, for their property, what is the right method or technology to use to provide a wireless service? There's Wi-Fi. There's this term called DAS. People talk about even small cells, which is part of the component. CBRS, which is what they, it's a citizen broadcast radio, which is a different band that's being provided. It's more of a neutral host spectrum. What, what is the right option for the property owner? And if they invest in something today, is it viable for the next five years? Will they have to pay again an upgrade? And the fact is that early on in the early 2012 and 13, operators were investing capital to provide indoor service. But as it's becoming more of a utility, wireless operators are looking for the property owners to invest and pay for that infrastructure themselves. It's not there yet, but there's still a large pipeline of areas that property, owner, uh, property owners have access to a venue where wireless operator is willing to pay for that infrastructure or somehow share on that cost. But the mechanism to get to that point is really difficult for the property owner. And what they usually do is they hire third party vendors to come in, knock on the door to get the acquisition process in order to establish the lease, the dialogue, in order to get the property owner signed up. We gotta realize that 80% of the mobile data is indoor. 87% companies would switch providers for a better indoor coverage. This is a trend that the operators don't wanna see. They wanna ensure every building is covered inside so that if someone goes in there, they have the coverage they need. They don't have to have to switch to another provider. As Ian illustrated, churn is the number one thing that an operator wants to avoid. They want to maintain them as a loyal customer. Part of that is to get better service inside their building. So what does that mean to the real estate owner? You have to identify partners and the solutions that meet their needs, their clients' needs, and brings various types of technologies, infrastructure, finance, there's companies out there that will finance that infrastructure and actually pay for the infrastructure and finance it in a way that it looks like a utility bill. So that property owner does not need to pay that large bill for that technology to integrate it in. And if they have a multi-dwelling unit or a, like a private commercial building, they can have someone finance it and they can distribute the cost across the system. Uh, next slide, please. So what's the problem currently for the property owners? Property owners need a simple system that will allow them to monetize an outdoor small cells quickly. That means being able to say, I am interested to have a small cell, and immediately communicate to the operator saying, I am available to be contacted if you need a small cell here. Contact me and make it easy. Property owners want to ensure they have in-building coverage for their buildings and assets. They want to ensure that all operators are covered, that they provide the best service for their tenants or for themselves. Property owners need to understand what's all the technology options and the wireless systems out there. There are so many different ways to improve service out there, but what's the right technology that ensures it lasts for the next 10 years, ensures that it's 5G proof, ensures that it's able to grow with what the operator's technologies are growing and changing. An operator changes technologies every 18 months. You have to ensure that the technology is deployed today, lasts for the next 10 years. And lastly, there has to be a platform that allows them to manage this wireless approach. Make it simple and valuable. Make it a system that they can monetize on. And that's a problem statement that right now exists. When we ask an operator, what is a problem is, we need the property owner to be educated and we want them to know that we're out there looking to put small cells we want to do it fast. How do we educate that? And the problem when we speak to the property owners, they go, well, we don't understand why the wireless is needed. We don't understand how we go and talk to these operators. And we don't understand the financial incentives. How do we know whether we're being paid enough? And how do we know whether the terms that we're signing is within industry standards? 
And that's what we're wanting to solve. Could you go to the next slide, Ian? So through that process, and myself, I've been in the in wireless industry for the last 20 years. I've worked for an operator for the first 10 years, and I've worked as a consultant for operators for the last 10 years. Through this problem, we created smallcellsite.com. And truly, the process of this platform is to connect the two parties with, with the internet, using a technology platform that allows a property owner to say, I own this asset, it is ready, any operator, please contact me through this platform. And since we work with all the operators, our platform is in their hands. We work as a company to go out there and get ourselves exposed with every operator as much as possible. We work to place these, every opportunity, every property that we have in our platform, we market to ensure that every operator gets to see that location so if they need to put a small cell in their area where they need to provide capacity or provide better coverage, they know that there is an asset ready to go and they realize they don't have to go through the SAT acquisition process. They realize that it's rarely set up. The property owner knows what they're looking for. They know what their rent process is. All it is is a transaction. And that's why this platform got created, which is smallcellsite.com. Could you go to the next slide? So what does smallcellsite.com do? It allows a property owner to place their asset in an open marketplace for outdoor placement and indoor. When a property owner says, I have a building, they put their address, they put the height of the building, but they also say, I want better indoor service. When they check that, an operator immediately sees that information. It reduces the education gap for market value. The property owner gets to establish what the market rate is, but also they'll realize what the market availability is. We can tell you that we said it's up between 150 to 400 dollars, and that's a reality. The small cell market is in those price points. They're looking for around 250 in some locations, and if the equipment's small enough, they want to pay only 100 dollars a month. But they're wanting to do it for a long time, five years with five-time auto renewals. So that could be a 25-year lease. All Tier 1, Tier 2, MNOs, and even MSOs use smallcellsite.com for small cell deployment. We are working daily to get, we have two of the main top four operators looking at it. We've got a third one already looking into it, and then the fourth one we're pushing forward. All operators have access to our platform. We will talk to them every day. So what that does is the property owner knows that the operators are looking at their assets. They don't have to worry about that process. It's an added service for analytics. We provide the data for the operators to show this is fiber, is there power, and also we illustrate if there's surrounding deployment. So if your location is hot, we'll illustrate in our platform, there's been other outdoor small cell deployments occurring and if that's true, then that means that it's more is going to happen. One um, urban myth is once a small cell is deployed in one location, there's no more needed. That is not true. If a small cell gets deployed, there's hundreds more to get deployed. Because once one operator deploys it, that means that that's where the capacity is. That's where the demand is for wireless usage. Our platform illustrates that. So what we've done is we've created a platform that brings intelligence. It gets the operators who are wanting to deploy access to all the assets that are out there. Currently, smallcellsite.com has 110,000 assets in listing. We have various, we have hundreds of property owners that put their assets in our marketplace, and we day by day we get operators saying we want to choose this location. This is a platform to minimize the education. And once a property owner puts their asset in our marketplace, smallcellsite.com representatives will contact you and talk to you about. What is it you're looking for? What are some of the processes? Educate you on what is the rate in your area. It creates an immediate education and allows you to ask questions. We become the partner to help make you revenue and also provide better service to your location at a minimal cost. Because what we'll do is if you want a better in-building system, we'll walk you through that system to explain what's your building, what type is it, and then we have the knowledge and the research to be able to explain what are the options. 
to be able to solve that problem. Next slide. So what are the indoor solutions? So once you face this asset, what are the indoor solutions out there? Well, look, there's different solutions. One key component that's really talked about is DAS. And DAS, which stands for Distributed Access System, or Antenna System, is a great option. It's the most economical way to have multiple operators in one location. However, it's expensive. It can go anywhere from $2 to $2.10 per square foot. Now, this technology is coming in. There's a lot of um, infrastructure and OEMs and vendors that have helped to reduce that price. But it's a higher price point. Operators sometimes want to use there's terms like Femto. There's other terms like small cell or DOT that they want to introduce into. Or there's hybrid DAS. There's shared DAS. There's DRAN, CRAN. What are, what's the best option? All of those options are correct. But the property owner needs to understand what their building is, where the location is. You, they have to work with each operator to understand if any, all the operators interested. If they're not, if there's only one operator interested, how do you solve that? The M&As &A, M are changing their strategies. Mobile network operators are wanting to find ways to do zero rent where it's self-funded. They want the operator to just say yes, but the building owner pays for the infrastructure. That is their mission and their goal. They want to make it into a utility. They see it as a fourth utility. One issue with small cells is, and people in, in those compared to DAS, is a small cell can serve one or two operators. It's not the best. In order to get all operators to serve in one location, that means you have to deploy four small cells per location, four different systems. It could be the same system, but you have to deploy that many times of hardware. DAS allows it to be more distributed, so you don't have to do that. Uh, there's other economical ways like shared head, head end DAS that allows coverage in multiple locations through one hotel. But these options that the property owner has to decide becomes a barrier of entry. And there's a lot of companies out there that come in to educate, and there's a lot of financing options that exist. What we're trying to do in smallcellsite.com is alleviate that. We want to be able to use our platform to immediately communicate to the operator. Someone's interested to get an in-building coverage. We work with that individual to help with the operator to have that discussion and immediately match, create the match between the OEMs with a financing partner and with the operator that helps solve that problem. What we're trying to become is, in essence, the mutual internet of match among multiple parties to ensure wireless is provided everywhere. And that's truly what smallcellsite.com is becoming. Next slide. I think that's it. Right, Ian? Great. Thank you. Very good, Chevin. So I'm going to sum up uh, what you said. So basically, you're like a dating site for the building owners and the operators, right? Um, they go it. on your they go on your site and they look at each other and they say yeah it looks pretty good they swipe left they swipe right etc cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> That's it. That's um, exactly right. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to pick up on one important point you said, and then we've got a bunch of questions. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I'm glad we've uh, we've got uh, some time left here uh, because we we've had a lot. Um, um, so. Before we go any further, um, several people have asked, are we sending out the slides? Yes, we will be sending out the slides. Um, you'll get an email from um, IGR later today or tomorrow with the slides. You'll also get an email in about 24 hours with the recording and how to download and access that. So um, anybody who missed anything today, no need to try and write everything down. Um, one important thing I want to pull up on though as well is, um, you said that you do actually match a building owner um, with an operator, but also with financing partners. Um, and um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. We've had a lot of questions on how do I deploy, how do I do this, how do I do that? But at financing, obviously, as you said, the operators don't want to pay for things. They're putting their capital budgets today into 5G. They've built all the, the sports stadiums, the NFL stadiums were built with DAS, what, four or five years ago. And so the operators, as you said, have really changed their strategy. They don't fund in-building uh, networks anymore or stadiums. They're really focusing on the outdoor and 5G. 
So if you want to put in an in-building system in a commercial building, you're going to need some, a source of financing. Um, so do you work with those partners? Do you bring all those financiers in as well? That's, How does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we usually do is we vet the process in, in a tiered mechanism. One is if, it needs, if it's an in-building system, we look at what are the right options that meets the operator's needs along with the property owner's needs. And then what we understand, when we look at it, we'll help to advise, is this something that is needed by the operator in such a demand for a capacity that they're willing to fund it? And we're able to be able to establish that through dialogue. If we look and realize that the operators through our relationships and through our process of our platform are not, what we do is we work to establish the partners, and there's various mechanisms of funding. There are OEM financing. There's also private equities out there that want to finance an infrastructure similar to this to be able to provide that cap to the property owner and make it into a utility bill. So what we do is we try to connect all those individuals in that process, and we educate it. But our goal is, if tier one, step one is we find, is there an operator willing to fund it themselves? If the answer is yes, then we help establish that. If no, then we help to understand what's the right solution for that property owner that meets their needs. For, is it a specific carrier or is it multiple carriers? And then we help them find that process through either of us. Working with an infrastructure like an OEM or finding a financing partner that helps through that process. Okay, good. And I think one other point, um, just to summarize again, you had the triangle diagram earlier talking about how important uh, cost is to small cell deployment, but also location. Um, and I, don't, I think a lot of people don't realize that the operators, when they're planning outdoor small cells, they can't just drop them anywhere. It's not just a case of, oh, we need 10 small cells in this urban area or 50 small cells, go deploy them. Because the small cell is linked to the, the major network, the macro network, everything is tied together. And so... Um, I think Sprint did a study four or five years ago where they planned out their ideal small cell network in an urban area, and then they moved all the cells by half a block. And what they found was that the network performance dropped by 50% just by moving everything half a block. Um, so in your site, when, when it says, you know, there's demand for a small cell here, it really, the operator doesn't have an option to move it to the other side of the building in many cases. They mean, I need it on this side of the building facing this junction. Um, so the specificity, if I'm correct, is, you know, is, is that detailed, right? That, that is correct. I mean, location, 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 and I think that's a real estate term also. It's, you know, real estate's about location, location, location. Small cells is that way. If a small, the reason it's called small cell is it's really trying to focus on, a, on an area that's very focused. If by they don't, if they want it in one location, it has to be within that location. So they don't really try to have the option. If they move it, they don't get the benefits, and then it doesn't meet their ROI model. Right. Okay. So we've got lots of questions, and uh, I'll just start running through them here. Um, we've had overlapping questions on several. So. Um, and just to let everybody know, if you did ask a question and we don't answer it direct completely, um, I'll follow up with you later today. We do get a report from the system that tells us uh, who asked which question. I'll make sure we get all of them answered. So the first one is, um, please compare CBRS possibilities with 5G and small cells. Um, so uh, I'll take a stab at this. And Shervin, uh, I, want, I want to hear your views on CBRS as well. CBRS is three and a half gigahertz. It's a new band. Um, they, uh, the FCC is supposed to be licensing at some point, but the, it's basically lightly licensed or unlicensed. Um, it is for small cells. Um, a lot of it will be indoor. It can be outdoor as well. Um, but um, uh, today's networks are at uh, what around one gig, two gig, two and a half gig. Uh, this would be three and a half gigahertz. So a little bit higher in the band, but ideal for small cells, ideal for indoor. There's a lot of people looking at CBRS because obviously it's a new source of spectrum, but what we're waiting on is the FCC. Um, now, what do you deploy in CBRS? Well, the radios are actually LTE, 
And uh, by the time we get them deployed, they will be upgradable to 5G. So CBRS is not limited. It's not 5G only. It's not competing with 5G. It's just another band to be used um, as we use two and a half gig, five gig, et cetera. So Shevin, what are your views on CBRS? Do you get a lot of questions on those? Oh yeah, CBRS I think is the, I'm, I'm very bullish on CBRS. I think CBRS is truly the next uh, pivot point for wireless. What CBRS does, it does provide the mechanism for and the opportunity for private LTE. Anybody can deploy CBRS. It is a shared spectrum. That's the that right term is shared spectrum because you have to use a SAS, which is a shared access spectrum controller, which is something that SEC has approved. Very few vendors like Federal Wireless, ComScope, uh, there's ComSearch. These are the providers that will, you have to sign up. If you are to deploy CBRS, you have to sign up with a SAS controller. But it allows you to, in essence, have access to right now 150 megahertz of bandwidth, which that is a lot. An operator currently, except Sprint, which has a lot more, on average has roughly 110 megahertz. With CBRS, anybody now becomes their own operator. The building owner or a, you know anybody can become and create their own network. The analogy I use is McDonald's could deploy CBRS in every location and now have become McDonald's network and literally become their own private LTE for the customers. And CBRS will be deployed with enhances, enhances get enabled with CBRS. It allows, in, in essence, an ecosystem for anybody to become a wireless operator or provide capacity and coverage inside their building, similar to what they do with Wi-Fi. Okay, great. And we've got a follow-on question here, which uh, you, you've kind of hinted at here. Let's, so let's take that one next ways. Uh, can you speak more to private LTE networks? And I'll extend this into private 5G by extension. Um, is there access managed by device SIM or by the provider, the telco, or by the customer, i.e. the owner of the private network? So how do you see private, um, how do you see LTE, private LTE being deployed? Well, I think that it's a very good question. Private LTE is going to be deployed. Is, is anybody deploying currently Wi-Fi? When someone deploys a Wi-Fi network, you put a system up, it's an SSID that's recognized, and the individual, who's a, whoever the customer is, decides to whether to go on that network. A private LTE, the individual can deploy their own private LTE and have and just create their own ecosystem of providing the devices themselves to the customers and saying, use my device whenever you want to use my network, or they could make it open enough that the SIMs are able to latch on when decided by the customer themselves without having to switch devices. Uh, the process and the mechanism is pretty open. That's the, in terms of the device ecosystem of how it gets latched on, there's a lot more technicalities to it. But if you look at CBRS and kind of where the ecosystem, along with the CBRS on go, which is their certification process in their body, it allows, in essence, anybody to be able to create their own network and, and that provide all the ecosystems from the device to the controllers, authentication, and even the billing, however they want it. Right. And uh, the one thing I think I'd add to that is that in some cases, um, well, first, two things. Firstly, a lot of big enterprises, big companies, you know, the, the Fortune 100, um, are working with the operators today to actually use part of the operator spectrum for a private network. So an operator would actually lease a little bit of spectrum in a certain location to a Fortune 100 for a private network. And obviously the enterprise is going to pay for that. Um, CBRS opens up a lot more options here for private LTE networks. Again, because as Shervin said, there's 150 megs potentially of unlicensed spectrum there that you can use. But that private LTE network could be just for, let's say, security cameras or drones around the building or the use of the maintenance staff with specific devices. It could be opened up just to uh, the tenants or it could be opened up to anybody who walks in the door with a paywall. So there's different, uh, different configurations there. Um, okay, let's look at the next one here. Um, uh, do the operators take into account uh, in-building opportunities to help alleviate the congestion in those 20% of locations. So I think the question here is, I've got some congestion in my urban area. Will the operator look at putting in an in-building wireless solution to alleviate that problem rather than putting in outdoor small cells? 
Do you see that? Uh, yeah, you see that occurring? Yeah. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, yes. I mean, in building is a very big function. Uh, the operators that also look for within that in building, how many pedestrians? What's the number of individuals that walk inside that building or stay or commute? That is a big factor. But yeah, if they're looking to con uh, alleviate the problem in a location, indoor is the first option to look to before because that's quick. There's not minimal, there's no zoning required as long as the in-building inside the system can be alleviating the capacity. That's the number one option to look into immediately. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm just running down the list here. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. It's good. Um, is there a small cell opportunity in residential? That's where I find most dead spots. Now, I don't think small cell site, you don't cover the residential market specifically. Is that correct? That is, well, I, we have, it's funny, we have a lot of individuals put their houses on our marketplace. I've got my house in the marketplace. The, <laughs> the, answer, the answer is that, uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, if you look at where fixed wireless access is going with 5G, residentials will be an option where, uh, you know, I personally do believe that over in the future with fixed wireless access with millimeter wave and 5G, residentials will become an option of distributing better signal. Uh, but right now, in the current time frame, residentials are not being covered with small cells, but I don't dismiss it. The trends right. are looking that way right now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there are, um, I can talk to this from my side. Uh, I haven't put my house on your website. Maybe I should. <laughs> Tell my wife I can get a couple of hundred bucks a month. Um, <laughs> um, uh, my house, actually, uh, at the front of the house, we're on one cell site, and at the back of the house, we're on a different cell site. We are the, literally the definition of cell edge. Uh, I, also, I live in Texas, so uh, I have low E windows and radiant barrier. Our, our house is a horrible RF environment. I actually put a signal booster in, um, which basically takes the outside signal and retransmits it on the inside of the house. Works great. Um, carriers also have uh, femto cells, uh, these small cells just yep. for residential. Uh, I think uh, Sprint's uh, Magic Box does that. Is that right? Um, and there are other solutions as well. So there are solutions out there, but... Um, uh, Google search it, you'll find quite a few, but Signal Boost is a good place well, to start. So. so so I want to add to that Sprint Magic Box. I mean, we, it, Small Cell Site was a really good asset to use for deployment. We used uh, part of that process. If we identified residential even locations that individuals wanted better coverage, Sprint Magic Box was the solution that we used to deploy through that process. So I'm glad you brought up that point. Yeah. Great. Good. Um, okay, next question. Um, and we haven't talked about this. So I think this is a good, uh, we can talk about this for a few minutes here. Um, how can backbone, how can a backbone fiber provider get involved with this effort to expand small cell to commercial properties? Uh, now, Shervin mentioned through his presentation, I didn't get into the architecture too much, but small cells today need a fiber connection to them. It's usually a dark fiber connection. Um, if the outdoor small cell is on a pole or a street light or something like the street furniture, the fiber's got to get to that location, which usually means digging up the street, et cetera, et cetera. And it can sig significantly add, adds to the cost. We've just done a report on this. Um, if you're putting a small cell in a building, then the assumption would be that there'd be fiber available in that building. So, and I think on your, uh, I've got this uh, slide up here, but do you, Oh, there's a distance to fiber um, uh, and property type there. So do you cover fiber on small cell sites? How, you know, what sort of questions do you get there? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Fiber is key for small cells. Uh, there's various options, but one is you know, dark fiber is the key. And what we define it in our terms is front hall. So I would say that any fiber provider who has access and has even franchise or has fiber, the opportunities, right? You need to work with the operator. Our platform does partner with fiber providers by placing their uh, assets in our system. And so what happens is when an operator wants to go on an asset, we do a distance, average distance to fiber, and we have a partner with any fiber.com who's an aggregator. That's one of the key partners. What we also do is bring in other fiber providers that have their own database to bring it in. And when we work with the operator, they say, we need access to fiber. We'll provide the partners that we have access to and the closest to them so that the operator can say, I want to go, and they'll either choose for dark fiber or whatever the option they're looking for. Even they could also want to let the Ethernet or DOCSIS, whatever the mechanism that they want to be able to provide the backhaul to the small cell. 
Okay, great. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. There's a few more questions I want to get to. Um, we've, we've had literally uh, 30 or 40 questions just come in the last few minutes, so we're not going to get to all of them today. Um, for those of you who have asked questions, I will get back to you today. Um, I'll send you an email. We can continue the discussion, but we will get answers for you. But I do want there's two more, actually, I do want to um, discuss here, Shervin. One is a couple of people asked, how do you get paid? How does small site small cell site make money? Yep, we uh, just take a small percentage of the revenue that we bring in. So what we'll do is we help to establish the billing process. So the thing that it does for the operator is that they don't have to send thousand checks to a thousand different properties. They send it all to us and we have an automated system that once we get the check, we, we take a percentage depending on the system. If it's a large provider, it's a different percentage amount and then we pass the rest back to the owner. One thing that makes us unique is our percentages are very low compared to what the normal standard agents are out there. Okay. And um, I'm going to pull this slide up because we show the U.S. here. We have a couple of questions. Do you extend to uh, Canada and do you extend to Mexico? Uh, great question. We are looking and building a process right now to go international. We're looking at Australia right now, Canada, and the Cala region as the next option for expansion. Okay. And we're and I know to probably to... start by 2019 is our starting okay. point right now. Great. And I, I did notice that you don't have anything in North Dakota either. I don't know if it's just a uh, – <laughs> maybe you should add that to the list. It goes in our – I know. <laughs> um, uh, okay. And, okay, last question here. Um, can you uh, – let's make this the last question. It's a good one. Can you saturate an area without building systems that would penetrate and provide good coverages in building? Uh, maybe make, maybe it is fifty percent as effective as DAS, but it saves that two dollars, two dollars and ten cents a square foot. Um, the answer, actually, it depends. Um, if it's a relatively small building, then yes. But if it's a building with um, nice uh, reflective glass on the front, low E windows, lots of steel construction, concrete construction, that signal from the outside. Uh, is only going to go so far. Uh, the lower the frequency, the better. Um, it'll go further, but uh, in every building like that, if you get in an interior conference room or uh, bathrooms or uh, um, stairwells, you're going to have problems. So the only effective, reliable way to provide in-building coverage in a large commercial modern building, let's say, is um, using an in-building system. Uh, warehouses, uh, hospitals actually are some of the worst RF environments because they're screened for medical devices and things like this. Um, so hospitals always have their own uh, uh, deployments. Manufacturing, warehousing can be a little different because you obviously have big open areas, but could be a concrete and metal uh, construction with a metal roof, which RF doesn't like. So. Um, well, with that, I think we're about out of time. Shervin, we've got loads of questions. Uh, I'm going to forward some of them to you. Um, some people did want to talk to you. They've got opportunities. Um, they've got uh, acreage and buildings that they want to talk to you about. So um, I think you and I are going to be on email for a few days. But I want to thank That's you great. very much. Um, this, has been, this has been great. We've taken all the time um, and uh, obviously a very interactive crowd. Again, for everybody on the call, we will be sending out the slides. We will be sending out the details of how to get the recording. I want to thank uh, Connected Real Estate Magazine for the uh, support and the promotion of this, and obviously thank uh, Shervin and Small Cell Site for, for the content today. Thank you. Thank you.